On today's episode of Pop History Podcast, Goldie Hawn drops and gives us 20. A little yellow guy encourages us to eat a ton of pills. And speaking of drugs, our queen encouraging us to smoke a dube? Let's kick it! You're listening to Pop History Podcast, a show which opens a chronological time capsule of our past. If you're a child of the 80s, a pop culture historian, or just a fan of nostalgia, keep tuning in for your weekly lesson of pop history. Now here's your host, Jay Jackson. Welcome, everyone, to another great episode of Pop History Podcast. I'm your host, Jay Jackson. Today we're going to look at everything that was rad and bad in October of 1980, all while we count down the top Billboard pop hits of the week of October 11th. Let's get to the countdown. Number 10. Kicking off the countdown this week is a song that will earn this singer a Grammy for Best Male R&B Vocal Performance. Here is George Benson with Give Me the Night. Interesting factoid about singer George Benson. He was the first to record the song The Greatest Love of All in 1977 for the biopic on Muhammad Ali titled The Greatest. Although the song was a respectable hit in its own right, it would later be overshadowed in 1985 by Whitney Houston's cover version. What to do about overcrowded L.A. schools at 11? I hate it. It's like a, a thumping inside my head. Mrs. Wyman, I want you to choose any one of these pain relievers. Two regular tablets, 650 milligrams. 650 milligrams, 650 milligrams, or you can have more, 800 milligrams. Anison has more pain reliever. And a special combination of ingredients. I'll try the Anison. My headache's gone already. From now on, I'm an Anison fan. Get the Anison difference. Let's take a look at the headlines of October of 1980. A 7.1 earthquake struck the northern region of Algeria with over 2,600 killed and 8,000 injured. For the first time in their 98-year history, the Philadelphia Phillies beat the Kansas City Royals to win the World Series. Third baseman Mike Schmidt won the World Series MVP award, with Pete Rose a close runner-up. After trying to admit himself to the Buffalo Psychiatric Center in September of 1980, and being refused after staff members decided he was not a danger to himself or others, Joseph Christopher proves them wrong when he begins his racially motivated killing spree this month. Christopher murdered six black men before enlisting in the U.S. Army, and it wouldn't be until he attacked a fellow soldier in January when a psychiatric evaluation led to his indictment. Christopher would die in prison in 1993. England Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher delivers her famous The Ladies Not For Turning speech at the Conservative Party Conference. With the nation in a recession and unemployment still rising, Thatcher stood by her refusal to perform a U-turn to her liberalization of the economy. Thatcher ended her speech with, For those waiting with bated breath for that favorite media catchphrase, the U-turn, I have only one thing to say. U-turn if you want to. The ladies not turning. The speech was very warmly received at the conference, and she received a five-minute standing ovation. In other UK news, the Queen has also made history after becoming the first British monarch to make a state visit to the Vatican. Pope John Paul II welcomed Her Majesty and the Duke of Edinburgh for what was described as a warm and relaxed encounter. Heavyweight boxing champion Larry Holmes defends his title against Muhammad Ali, who was coming out of retirement in an attempt to become the first four-time world heavyweight champion. The 38-year-old Ali 
was no match for Holmes, and the fight was stopped after the tenth round, with Holmes being the winner. Number nine! From the album One Step Closer, their final recording before the departure of band member Michael McDonald, here are the Doobie Brothers with Real Love. ninth studio album that was the doobie brothers with real love a song that would rise to number five later this month and it was the band's fourth top 10 single just a little bit of movie news this month one of the first films released on beta and vhs video cassette by mgm cbs home video this month is the 1939 classic the wizard of oz we don't have the price on that but i'm sure it was probably pretty high Let's take a look at what's new at the local movie theater. John Cassavetes writes and directs the thriller Gloria. Diane Cannon and Robert Blake star in Coast to Coast. Frank Sinatra appears in his final starring film role in the suspense film The First Deadly Sin. Although the film wasn't a big commercial success, the performance by Sinatra was hailed by critics as one of the best of his career. The film is also notable for being the debut of a young Bruce Willis. George Burns returns, portraying the man upstairs in the sequel to the 1977 hit with Oh God, Book Two. Along with his hit album released last month of the same name, Paul Simon comes to the big screen in the film One Trick Pony. Simon also wrote this fictional story of a once popular folk musician. Young director David Lynch creates the historical drama about the story of a severely deformed man in 19th century London. John Hurt stars the, the Elephant Man. One of the film's producers was legendary comedian Mel Brooks, leading some audiences to believe the film might be a comedy. The film was the farthest thing from being funny, but it was critically and commercially successful, receiving eight Academy Award nominations and being inspiration for a new Oscar category, Best Makeup and Hairstyling. Stepping away from his role as the Man of Steel, Christopher Reeve stars with Jane Seymour in a time-travel fantasy romance somewhere in time. Jamie Lee Curtis defends her Scream Queen title in the slasher film Terror Train. Loving Couples stars Shirley MacLaine, James Colburn, and Susan Sarandon. The real-life story of a Utah service station owner who is listed as a beneficiary of $156 million in a will allegedly handwritten by Howard Hughes is dramatized in the film Melvin and Howard. Actress Mary Steenburgen will win an Academy Award for Best Supporting Actress for her role in the film. Mickey Rourke and Peter Horton appear in minor roles in the horror film Fade to Black. Diane Lane stars as the girl afflicted with cerebral palsy who writes to her favorite singer in Touched by Love, based on the book To Elvis with Love by Lena Kanata. Although it was originally intended to be a serious horror film, a low budget led to Motel Hell becoming a satire Critic Roger Ebert gave the film three out of four stars, calling it a refreshing sound of laughter, albeit disgusting, of course. Not quite as successful is the horror film The Awakening, starring Charlton Heston and Susanna York. I was a skinny, frightened lad, no more than 17. The sorriest excuse for a man that you have ever seen. But now I am a thorn bird and as proud as I can be. Colonel Thornbush made a man of... This ring is a symbol that you are my husband. This ring is a symbol that you are my husband. I want to give you two a little something for Mother and me, just to bring you a little extra happiness. This is Judy Benjamin. Oh! That's for the future, not Lord and Taylor. You know. All her life, she got everything she ever wanted. And a few things she didn't. Uh, 
I did join the Army, but I joined a different Army. I joined the one with the condos and the private rooms. What? No, really, my recruiter, Jim Ballard, told me that... I don't care. I don't care what your lousy recruiter told you, Benjamin. Now, I'm telling you, there is no other Army. Excuse me, sir. Is Green the only call of these comments? Benjamin, I don't want to see you stop running unless you collapse, faint, or puke. Has anybody ever died from basic... Personally, I think you've gone temporarily insane. That's what we told everyone. We said that you'd, uh, you'd, you'd had a collapse and, and uh, you were in a mental home. People think I'm in a mental home? Mm. I want to wear my sandals and I want, I want to go out to lunch. I want to be normal again. I just can't believe that you were in this army. Well, if I knew you better, I'd show you my dog tags. How much better? Glory, glory, I'll be falling through the sky. Glory, glory, I am not afraid to die. Glory, glory, I'm as proud as I can be. Colonel Farnbush made a man out of me. Goldie Hawn is Private Benjamin. Glory, glory, I am not afraid to die. Glory, glory, I'm as proud as I can be. Colonel Farnbush made a man out of me. Goldie Hawn stars in Private Benjamin, one of the biggest comedy hits of the year hit in theaters this month. The film was nominated for three Academy Awards, Best Actress for Goldie Hawn, Eileen Brennan as Best Supporting Actress for a memorable performance as Captain Lewis, as well as Best Original Screenplay. Brennan would also go on to reprise her role in the TV series of the same name, which ran from 1981 to 1983 and starred Lorna Patterson as Private Benjamin. In 2010, Anna Ferris was in talks to portray the title character in a proposed remake of the film, which never came to fruition. Number 8. Her song Magic was one of the biggest hits of the year. Now Olivia Newton-John is back with another song from her film Xanadu. This time she's backed by Jeff Lynn and the Electric Light Orchestra for the title track. Here is Xanadu. Olivia Newton-John, and Electric Light Orchestra with Xanadu. Although the film flopped at the box office, the soundtrack was a big hit. It featured side one of songs by Newton-John, including her previous hit, Magic, and the second side were songs written and performed by ELO, Electric Light Orchestra, with the finale being this song, bringing them both together. This song may only peak at number eight on the U.S. Billboard Top Ten, but it would top the charts in Canada, the Netherlands, Germany, Ireland, and the UK. Let's take a look at the comings and goings this month. Celebrities who came into this world include singer and actress Monica, actor Ben Foster, bass player Paul Thomas of Good Charlotte, actor and rapper Nick Cannon, singer Ashante, and socialite Kim Kardashian. Thankfully, our passing list is pretty short this month. Uh, we have 
Haiti Jacques. She dies at the age of 58. She was the regular on the British uh, comedy film franchise, Carry On. And then uh, Billy Thomas died of a heart attack in his Los Angeles home at the age of 49. Thomas is best remembered for his portrayal of Buckwheat in the R Gang, Little Rascals short films from 1934 until the series end in 1944. Thomas was the only R Gang cast member to appear in all 52 MGM shorts. When R Gang rap production, Thomas joined the U.S. Army. And when he returned home, he was not interested in continuing in acting. He had a successful career as a film lab technician with the Technicolor Corporation until his untimely death. Here's a little bit of Buckwheat. The scene from uh, Our Gang is Alfalfa as Romeo and a Buckwheat as Juliet when they perform a play in front of uh, their friends. Enjoy. Juliet, my Romeo, your eyes are like two of the fair stars in heaven. Come fly with me. Number seven. Our next song was featured prominently in the golf comedy Caddyshack. And it's now rising up the charts, peaking this week at number seven. Here is Kenny Loggins with I'm All Right. Kenny Loggins with I'm All Right. The song will be the first of several hit songs that Loggins will provide to film soundtracks, earn him the unofficial title of the King of the 80s Soundtrack. Fans of Wonder Woman star Linda Carter will get a chance to hear her sing the song next year in the 1981 television special Linda Carter's Celebration. Taking a look at music news this month. A riot breaks out at a Black Sabbath concert in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, after bassist Geezer Butler is hit in the head with a bottle, and the band stops the show and leaves the stage. Paul Katner of Jefferson Starship is rushed to the hospital following a cerebral hemorrhage. Defying medical odds, he soon recovers without surgery. The 14th Country Music Association Awards are held at the Grand Old Opry House in Nashville. Big winners include... Barbara Mandrell, George Jones, and Emmy Lou Harris. And a crazed concert goer stabs seven fans at a Blood, Sweat, and Tears concert in L.A. Number six. At number six this month is Paul Simon with the first single from his fifth solo album, One Trick Pony. Here is Late in the Eve. If you notice something different about the drum work in that song, you have an excellent ear. Drummer Steve Gadd devised a distinctive drum part by using two pairs of drumsticks, one in each hand, in order to give the impression of two drummers playing together. It's time once again for our TV theme trivia. This one's a toughie. Can you name this 1980 television show?
little cinnamon gum freshens breath longer than Big Red. So kiss a little longer, hug a little longer, state your case a little longer, longer with Big Red. That Big Red freshness lasts right through it. Your fresh breath goes on and on while you chew it. Say goodbye a little longer, make it last a little longer. Give your breath long-lasting freshness with Big Red. Sorry to take you out of the past and into the present, folks. We have to get some business taken care of here. Is this episode worth 25 cents to you? If you'd like to open your wallet a little bit and help us out, you can find us at patreon.com slash pophistorypodcast, where you can donate to help keep the show running at the highest level possible. Donations start at just $1 a month. That's an episode of Pop History Podcast for the price of a game of Space Invaders. Other ways you can help us out to support the show is by leaving an iTunes review. Those help increase our visibility on Apple Podcasts. Keep clicking the likes on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. That helps keep our posts active and accessible to more potential listeners. Drop us a line at pophistorypodcast at yahoo.com with a pod distance dedication, which we include in a future episode. We thank you for listening to Pop History Podcast and look forward to your feedback. Now, back to the show. Do you remember that TV theme song? This detective crime show starred Robert Urich as P.I. Dan Tanna, who took to the streets in a red 1957 Ford Thunderbird convertible, taking calls from his high-tech car phone, working with a wide variety of clients, helping to solve crimes, and making Sin City a better place for residents and tourists alike in the ABC series Vegas. The series, produced by Aaron Spelling, debuted in 1978 and ran for three seasons. Tony Curtis had a recurring supporting role as Slick Philip Roth, the owner of several hotel casinos. Ulrich was nominated twice for a Golden Globe for his performance on the show, but it was attacked by some critics, including journalist Gary Deeb, who called the show an awful program poorly written by the worst Hollywood hacks, produced in grade school cookie-cutter fashion by Aaron Spelling. Number five. Number five. Number five. Number in 1968, this artist moved to Nashville with $1,000 to his name, attempting to make it as a country singer. While in Nashville, he worked as a truck driver, soda jerk, and a fruit picker before he was ultimately hired as a songwriter for the Hill & Range Publishing Company, receiving a salary of $37.50 per week. After becoming a respectable country star with his albums Rabbit, Variations, and Love Line, he looked to cross over to pop music with his 1980 album Horizon. Here is Eddie Rabbit with Driving My Life Away. Eddie Rabbit's attempt to cross over from country to pop was a success in 1980. His sixth album, Horizon, did hit number one on the Billboard country charts and also ranked in the top 20 on the pop charts, thanks in part to his first single from that album, Driving My Life Away, which peaked at number five this week in 1980. New this week on vinyl, cassette, and 8-track, with 14 songs totaling 15 minutes in length, the punk band Circle Jerks released their now classic punk rock debut, Group Sex. Being described by some critics as the new wave of Black Sabbath, goth rockers Bauhaus released their debut album in the flat field. After mainstream success with their first two albums, English rock band The Police returned with Zenyatta Mandata. The album would spawn two hit singles and win two Grammys the following year. I'm sure we'll be hearing The Police soon enough. The young and multi-genre musician Prince releases his third studio album, Dirty Mind. 
Robert Hilbert of the Los Angeles Times described the album as confident and highly danceable blend of post-disco funk and tasty hardline rock. The Talking Heads, influenced by African polyrhythms, funk, and electronics, while recording the Bahamas, released their fourth studio album, Remain in Light. Rockers Thin Lizzy releases their tenth studio album, Chinatown, the first album with new guitarist Snowy White. Bet that's not his real name. Australian Rockers In Excess releases their self-titled debut. The R&B group Earth, Wind & Fire release their tenth studio album, the double-length record Faces. In a 2007 interview, singer Maurice White claimed that this album was his personal favorite. With their single, Sultans of Swing, bringing them a Grammy Award the previous year, Dire Straits releases their third studio album, Making Movies. Rolling Stone later ranked this album as number 52 in their Best Albums of the 80s list. Bruce Springsteen rises to superstardom with his fifth album, The River, a double album with 20 tracks. The record set on top of the album charts for four consecutive weeks. Disco queen Donna Summer releases her first album with the newly formed Geffen Records, titled The Wanderer. Rockers Cheap Trick enlist former Beatles producer George Martin to work on their fifth studio album, All Shook Up. The band took the opportunity of working with the legendary producer to experiment, taking their sound in a different direction. The fans are not excited for the change, though, as the album only made it to number 24, and the lone single, Stop This Game, failed to crack the top 40. Aretha Franklin releases her 29th studio album, and she must be running out of album titles, because this is the second of three albums to have the simple title, Aretha. The album features a cover version of the 1978 Doobie Brothers hit, What a Fool Believes. He might be a Jackson, but he isn't one of those Jacksons. English singer-songwriter Joe Jackson releases his third album, called Beat Crazy. Punk rockers The Damned branch out into goth and psychedelic rock on their fourth release, The Black Album. Bass player Captain Sensible later spoke about the album, saying that singer David Vinane's lyrics were moving in a darker direction during recording. It is goth, he said. We didn't set out to do it, but that's just the way it is. He did own a hearse, and he was a grave digger. With the departure of Joe Perry from the group and singer Steven Tyler's increasing drug issues, rock band Aerosmith were performing in smaller and smaller venues as their popularity began to wane. This month, Columbia Records releases the band's first Greatest Hits compilation. The collection was a slow burn, but eventually became the band's biggest selling album to date, with over 11 million copies sold in North America. The 64th album by Johnny Cash, Rockabilly Blues, is released. Creedence Clearwater Revival releases their second live album, originally titled The Royal Albert Hall Concert. It was later discovered that the recording took place at the Oakland Coliseum, and the album was changed to The Concert. The album features live versions of most of the band's hits, including Born in the Bayou, Bad Moon Rising, and Fortunate Sun. And Irish rock group U2 releases their debut album, titled Boy. The band went in the studio earlier this year with 40 songs written, and producer Steve Lillywhite used some interesting recording techniques, including recording Larry Mullen's drums in a stairwell, recording smashing bottles and forks played against a spinning bicycle wheel. The band found Lillywhite to be very encouraging and creative and worked with them several times in the future. The original album cover of a young boy was changed to a distorted photo of the band for the North American release, due to the record company's fears the band would be accused of encouraging pedophilia. Here is U2 with the opening track from their debut, as well as the first single, I Will Follow.
number four. The duo of Russell Hitchcock and Graham Russell, they make up the band Air Supply, and they were undoubtedly a big hit at school dances throughout the 80s. Here they are with their hit, All Out of Love. I had to double check on that during the song, and yes, that is Russell Hitchcock and Graham Russell. Um, okay, there you go. That was Air Supply from their album Lost in Love. That was All Out of Love, a single which peaked at number two before falling to number four this week. Let's take a quick rundown of Nielsen's top ten for the week of October 6th. At number ten, there's That's Incredible. Number nine, Dallas. Number eight, the NBC Big Event, which was a movie of the week. This one was The End, starring Burt Reynolds and Sally Field. Number seven, another one, the ABC Sunday Night Movie, which was Jaws. Number six, Real People. Number five, The Dukes of Hazard. Number four, 60 Minutes. Number three, the Johnny Carson Anniversary Special. Number two, Little House on the Prairie. And number one was the Auschwitz-based TV movie, Playing for Time. Looking at TV debuts this month, on Saturday morning, the shows Heathcliff, Heathcliff and A Thunder of the Barbarian make their debuts. Two daytime game shows make their debuts. Blockbusters on NBC, hosted by Bill Cullen, and the reboot of Gambit, also on NBC. The shows are brought on after the cancellation of the short-lived David Letterman show. The edgy morning talk show, which was praised by critics, did not go over well with the daytime crowd and ended its run after its debut in June. From the creators of Soap, I'm a Big Girl Now stars former soap actress Diana Canova as a young divorcee and mother who moves back in with her father, played by Danny Thomas. Lawrence Pressman stars as a recently divorced man working in a women's magazine in the CBS comedy Ladies Man. Maybe we should get him hooked up with the other girl from the other show. And did you ever catch this old sitcom which debuted this month? Did you catch that title in there? That was a show set at a restaurant at the top of the Bonaventure Hotel in Los Angeles. The sitcom It's a Living makes its debut this month. The show stars Barry Youngfellow, Gary Edwards, Marion Mercer, and Anne Gillian, the latter a former child star who will become a sex symbol of the early 1980s. Though personally, I like Wendy Shaw better. The show, which followed the lives of the staff of the restaurant, would last for two years on ABC, when it was put into syndication in 1983, it became a small hit. So much of the show was brought back in first-run syndication in 1985 for a four-season run. 
Number three. Our number one song last episode drops to number three this month. Here is the supreme singer Diana Ross with Upside Down. That was Diana Ross with Upside Down, a song that would later be covered and sampled by artists as vast as Salt and Peppa, Kid Rock, Missy Elliott, Puff Daddy, and MC Light. Let's take a look at some other pop culture news this month. Released in May of 1980 to lukewarm results, the Rubik's Cube begins to gain in popularity and soon becomes the biggest puzzle game of the year. The Cube puzzle becomes a huge craze throughout the rest of the early 80s being named the German Game of the Year. The game was initially priced at $9.99 and became insanely popular, even inspiring several books which proclaimed the ultimate solution to the puzzle. As of 2009, over 350 million cubes have been sold worldwide, making it the world's top-selling puzzle game. Parodying the lifestyle of the Wasp Elite, Lisa Binbox, the official preppy handbook, is released. The tongue-in-cheek humor reference guide illuminates many aspects of the conservative upper-middle-class society. Topics range from appropriate clothing for social events to choosing the correct college and major. Although the book was pure satire, it is one of the several elements responsible for the growing preppy culture of the 1980s. In a marketing campaign by General Mills, the cartoon rabbit who is consistently foiled from eating trick cereal with the slogan, Silly Rabbit, Tricks Are For Kids finally gets his day in the sun when the cereal manufacturer holds a box top mail-in contest in which kids get to vote if the rabbit gets to eat this sugary cereal. The results of the vote were overwhelmingly yes, and the rabbit was depicted in a subsequent commercial enjoying a bowl of tricks. A little FYI, the tricks rabbit debuted as a mascot for the cereal in 1959 and was originally a puppet before becoming an animated character. After a lukewarm release in Japan in May, the video game Pac-Man makes its debut in the United States. The game was originally going to be called Puck-Man, but Namco executives were concerned about vandals changing the name of the game on the cabinet to Obscene Word. The game was an immediate hit, quickly becoming far more popular than anything seen in the game industry up to this point. Pac-Man outstripped Asteroids as the best-selling arcade game in North America. By the end of 1980, the game would surpass the revenues grossed by the biggest movie of all time, which was Star Wars. By 1982, the game had sold 400,000 arcade machines, and an estimated 7 billion quarters have been inserted into Pac-Man machines worldwide. In addition, Pac-Man licensed products exceeded $1 billion. Pac-Man was different and successful for several reasons. It was the first original game mascot. The game established the maze chase game genre, and it opened gaming to female audiences. It was the first game to feature power-ups, cutscenes and the individual ghost had deterministic artificial intelligence, which reacted to player actions. But more than anything, the game inspired this classic theme song. Number two. At number two this week is a song debuting on the show, and it rockets up the charts. The song was written by Barry and Robin Gibb of the Bee Gees. After their huge success in the late 1970s, the band was asked to participate in musical endeavors for other artists. One of these artists approached Barry Gibb to write an album for her. Although he only appears on two of the songs on the album, 
Gibbs' influence would attribute to being on the cover photo with the singer. Although they both share the album cover, the album would be credited alone to Barbara Streisand, and her lead single from the album Guilty would be one of Streisand's biggest hits. Here is Woman in Love. Really not surprised that that song was written by the BG guys because that really sounds has a real BG sound to it. But that was a Barbara Streisand with "Woman in Love," a song which the singer stated she wasn't particularly fond of. She said she didn't believe in the meaning of the lyrics, and the song has been rarely performed live by the singer since. Next up on the show is a song that has impacted the pop culture mythos so much that it might be a surprise that the song never cracked the Billboard Top 10. It's our song that should have but didn't. This week's song that should have but didn't is the song that's become the trademark for the long career of this iconic country musician. It did top the country charts and would win a Grammy for best country song, but it barely made the top 20 on the pop charts this month. From the soundtrack to the film Honeysuckle Rose, here is Willie Nelson with "On the Road Again." On the road again. Just can't wait to get on the road again. Life I love is making music with my friends. And I can't wait to get on the road again. On the road again. Going places that I've never been. Seeing things that I may never see again. And I can't wait to get on the road again. On the road again. That was country music icon Willie Nelson with "On the Road Again," as well as winning a Grammy. The song was also nominated for an Academy Award for Best Original Song. Nelson claimed he wrote the song while on an airplane on a barf bag, and the song has been featured in such film and TV shows as South Park, Shrek, Forrest Gump, Monk, and The Family Guy. The show has been covered by artists as vast as Buck Cherry, Kids Songs, Deanna Carter. Me first in the Gimme Gimmes and Elvin the Chipmunks. Here's a taste of the Chipmunks version. Just kidding. How about the punk rock version by Me First in the Gimme Gimmes from 2006? Looking for something, Betty? For relief, Mrs. Rollins. Hemorrhoids again. Pain, itch. Try this. Preparation H. Many folks tell me it temporarily relieves occasional pain and itch of hemorrhoidal tissues. Fast. Really works. Folks swear by it. Even helps shrink swelling due to inflammation. I'll try it. Feeling better today? Thanks to you and Preparation H. Preparation H relieves pain and itch, helps shrink swelling. Number one. Topping the charts this week is a song that has been sitting in the top ten since September. Spending a total of 15 weeks in the Billboard Top 10 for three weeks in October, Queen sat at top of the charts with another one bites the dust. In the early 80s, the song was one of many rock songs that Christian evangelists alleged contained subliminal messages through a technique called backmasking. Let's play a little clip and see if you hear anything. <laughs> Did you hear it? Some claim that the chorus, when played in reverse, 
can be heard as, It's fun to smoke marijuana. Let's hear it one more time. A spokesperson for Hollywood Records has denied the song contains any backwards message. Anyway, here is Queen with the top song of the month of October 1980. With the fourth single from the game, here is We Like to Smoke Mar- I mean, Another One Bites the Dust. Queen at the top of the charts this week with Another One Bites the Dust. In the crowd at one of their shows earlier this year was none other than Michael Jackson, who told the band they should release this song as a single. It was good advice as the song spent three weeks at number one in October of 1980. That does it for Pop History Podcast this time, folks. Thanks for tuning in. Remember, you can find all these songs in their entirety by going on Spotify and searching for pop history podcast all one word see you next time we look at november 1980 remember life is short be nice to each other to Pop History Podcast. Please leave us a review on iTunes, like us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, or email us at pophistorypodcast at yahoo.com. Your host and producer is Jay Jackson. Theme music by Jason Parkhurst. All other music used herein is the property of their respective songwriters, publishers, and recording companies and are used within this podcast for historical educational purposes. Pop History Podcast is copyright 2017.